Right. We're starting a new quarter, starting a new book. We're in Acts, and uh, quite a quite a different study from what we've done in the last quarter. What we're looking at now is uh, the the second book of two books that Luke wrote that, that kind of go together, the Gospel of Luke and then the uh, the Acts, Acts of the Apostles. Uh, so what you're seeing here is is with Luke and with this two books written in an eyewitness account, inspired by the Holy Spirit, of course, uh, God's words that Luke penned. But but Luke was. What's interesting here for us is, is we get to see a first-hand account of these things. And the Gospel of Luke, of course, uh, all about Jesus and about his ministry here on earth and such. And then Acts is more of an early history of the church. Uh, and looking through this and studying and reading, I'm sure you all are familiar that the time frame that this covers, that this book covers, is like, Depends on who you, who you look ask or, or who you're reading from. There, it's 32 to 35 years. I had never thought about it in in those terms, but that's a pretty wide ranging wide range of time when we're talking about a history of the early church. And I, I know the Bible covers thousands of years, but but still, when you're talking about this one book, I had never thought of it in those terms. I don't know how I thought it all played out, but I thought it was a little shorter term than that. But um, so you have the first 12 chapters regarding mostly about Peter and, and his, um, his participation or, or part of the, the growth of the church. And then chapters 13 through 28, more along the lines of Paul and, and his ministries and such. And it's, it's interesting, too, to see that it says here in the first verse that was not one that we were focused on. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. So you see here that this was these two books were actually, when Luke was putting them down, he was pinning them and, and to give to Theophilus. But he wrote them not just for him, but for us as well. It's interesting, and sometimes we're doing things and we don't realize maybe what we're doing, but we're trying to follow God's will and we think it's for this and it turns out to be of a greater use, of a greater good. And, and that's what, these, these weren't, two weren't just written for this one individual to, to read and to study and to have, but it was for all of us. So we're going to pick up with, uh, in chapter 1 here, verses 4 and 5. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father which he said, you have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So where we're at here is just prior to Jesus' ascension into heaven. And these are some of the last words that Jesus shared with the, with the apostles. And so he's telling them here, They've gathered up, and they're basically he's telling them goodbyes, I guess you could say. But he's telling them that uh, they're, they're not to leave Jerusalem. It's it's not time. To, you know, you you wonder what they were going to do. They they were they were in quite a mess after the crucifixion. They were in shock, you probably could say, and so they were sticking around for a few days to see him buried and such. But then. Then Jesus has been with them for 40 days and he's telling them now that he's, he's about to leave, but he's telling them not to leave. So you wonder just exactly what was going through their mind because I, I'm sure you know, they'd been persecuted. Jesus had been persecuted. They, you really didn't know. I, it's just one of those bucket list questions, I guess. So what was going through your mind when this was happening? Were you, were you afraid? Were you, were you all going to just disperse and go back home where you came from? <coughs> were you going to hang around and, and, you know, make a go of it together? Or did it take Jesus telling you and reminding you to not leave, to hang on? Because 
as he says here, but wait for the promise of the Father, which I've, which you've heard from me. Wait for the promise of the Father. Wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit. Jesus had already told them about this, but how many times did Jesus have to tell them something and remind them of the same thing over and over again? So he's already told them about, about the coming of the Holy Spirit, but he's having to remind them again. Same thing with us. We read the Bible and we read the verses and we know what God expects of us and we do the opposite. Or we forget what he's promised. Or you name it. But, but just like the apostles here, sometimes we have to be reminded multiple times. I mean, you want to say how many times you have to tell your kids to don't do this and they keep doing it. But, but then you also stop and think, well, how many times did our parents have to tell us not to do that, you know, but to remember. So it's it's human nature. And this, again, to me, is just Jesus looking out for him. He's telling them that you. I've told you about this. The Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. And where John baptized with water, you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit many days from now. You're going to be immersed. You're going to be completely in case with the Holy Spirit. And as he said here in our text, the Holy Spirit would not just dwell with them, but he would dwell in them. That's from John 14, 17. The Holy Spirit would testify of Jesus and enable believers to witness for him. The Holy Spirit would also be their teacher, teaching them all things and reminding them of everything Jesus had said to them. The Holy Spirit would come and replace the void Jesus left when he ascended. What Jesus had promised them was the full magnitude of the ministry of the Holy Spirit of convicting, regenerating, indwelling, sealing, baptizing, and filling believers in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is an essential sign that a person is a true believer. You know, do we take that for granted today? When we were saved and the Holy Spirit came to dwell within us? Or when he when we see someone else saved and the Holy Spirit comes to how comforting that is and how how it makes you feel, you know, when times get tough and we forget and we just have to know that, that God's with us. He's, a, he's in it, within us. But how was it like for these people? Because they followed Jesus Christ. They were there in his presence, but they didn't have the Holy Spirit within them. They had God right there in their presence. But that's why he's called the comforter. That's why Jesus was telling them, I'm not leaving you here. I'm not leaving you by I'm not leaving you by yourself. I'm not leaving you. Because it's God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that's got to be comforting to them to know that the Holy Spirit's going to come and be with them. Jesus will continue to be with them. God will be with them every step they take. It's the same with us. God's with us every step we take. So then we'll go through verses 6 and through 8. Therefore, when he had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Uh, you've thought about it, you've read about it, and you've heard about it, and you've talked about it before. These folks really still didn't grasp what was going on. What they were looking for was the Roman rule to be relieved from their backs. They, they were looking for the Roman rule to go away. They were looking for Jesus' millennial reign. They were looking for Jesus to be king here on earth, right now. You know, they, they got into discussions and arguments before about who was going to be the greatest. Who is going to be Jesus' right-hand man? Who's going to be number one for you? Because you're fixing the rule here on earth. That's what they were thinking. They, they thought he was about to take office. And he was going to, it was his kingdom that was about to. They were just thinking in small terms. Jesus is already king of all creation. And they were looking 
for something to be benefit them in the here and now. And that's what he's telling That's what they're asking. Is this it? Is this about the time? They can tell that he's about to leave. They can tell the way he's talking that he's about to leave them here. So they're, they're just wondering, where are you going, I guess? Are you going to Jerusalem? Are you going to Rome? Are you going to go to Rome and take over the kingdom from there? Or what? You know, I'm just throwing this out there, but that's that's probably some of the things that were going through the mind because that's what they were looking for to happen. And he's telling them. It's all in God's time. It's not for them to know. It's not for you to know the time of the seasons which the Father's put in his own authority. Jesus doesn't even know when he's coming back. So he's telling them it's it's not for them to know when the king when the rain will begin. It's not for Jesus to know. It's it's up to God. And the reason being is there's still a lot of work to be done. There's still a lot of things to do. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem. You know, these they're wanting Jesus to start his millennial reign. They're wanting Jesus to rule. And he's telling them, when you have the Holy Spirit within you, you're going to have power that's, that you just can't imagine, an ability to do things that you can't imagine, that you can't do on your own. That's what. That's why they wanted Jesus to be ruling, because he's going to be the ruler, and that'll give them more power, and they'll be able to go out and spread the word, and they'll be able to do it without fear. They won't have to worry about what's going to happen to them. They won't have to worry about mobs attacking them, because Jesus, their man, their their king, will be in charge, will be ruling, and it's what they don't get, and what's we don't always get. Jesus has already, already rules all. Satan's here on this earth and he has reign here on earth, but only because God allows it for a time, for a short time. So they're going to have this power when the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And he tells them, you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem. That's where they're at now. You're going to be witnesses to me in Jerusalem. You're going to have you're going to have power. He says, when Jesus gave the great commission in Matthew, he said, All power is <coughs> given unto me in heaven and earth. This is the power of authority. Jesus, as the head of every church, gave every church the permission to preach the gospel. The power spoken of in Acts 1 8 is the strength, power, or enablement. This power would come with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And we have this power today. So he's given them this power, this strength, to go out and share the gospel, to go out and preach to the people of Jerusalem. you got to start somewhere. You start locally. You start with your neighbors. You start with the people you know. You start where you're at. So they're going to start in Jerusalem. And then all of Judea and Samaria. Okay, that's the surrounding area. That also includes some areas that they don't like to go to. Samaria. Dealing with some people that historically they didn't like to deal with. The Samaritans. But it's not about the Jews. It's not about the Gentiles. It's about the Jews and the Gentiles. Jesus Christ, is to, is, he died on the cross for everyone. For everyone, for everyone that has ever walked on this earth, for everyone that ever will walk on this earth, for everyone that does walk on this earth. Jesus died for them. And it's not up to us to decide who's worthy or who's not. It's not up to us to decide that, oh, we like them, so we'll go share with them. Or, I don't like that person. I've seen what they've done. I, I've, I've heard stories about them. Well, you know what? They've probably heard stories about me. And they probably don't care, have any care about what I have to say. So we probably wouldn't G and haw if we were just there together amongst just the two of us talking. But when the power of the Holy Spirit is brought into the mix, when God's brought into it, and 
hearts can be softened. Minds can be opened. And that's what we're to do. So that's what he's talking about here. Into all Judea and Samaria. So then you go into the surrounding areas. And then to the end of the earth. Okay, that's pretty encompassing right there. That's everybody. That's all of us. So we recognize Jesus Christ as our Savior. The Holy Spirit dwells within us. And wherever we are, wherever God places us, whatever He lays before us, we're to share the gospel with those people. And the first way we do that is what was mentioned here just a moment ago. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit is the essential sign that a person is a true believer. When we meet people, do they see in us something that's a different? Do they see in us the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? To be able to know when they're convicted to listen to the gospel, when they're, when they're looking for answers, can they tell from us that this person is saved? This person that's telling me about Jesus Christ, he's the real thing. He's, I can tell what he's saying he's a part of, what he's talking about. He's not just blowing smoke. I can, he's told me these things, and I see it in his life. So, and, 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 and I know how he used to be. And I know where he came from. And I see where he's telling me he's going, and I see it a change. So, you know what? This that he's sharing with me must be so. This is something, this is something that I need in my life. This Jesus that he's telling me about. <clears throat> to the ends of the earth is where we're to go. In verses 12 through 14, Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, the zealot, and Judas, the son of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So Jesus tells them these things. They're on Mount Olivet, the Mount of Olives. And this is interesting. I, I like. And they returned into Jerusalem from the Mount called Olivet, which is from <coughs> Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. And there's fascinating things in the Bible that we'll just skim over and not pay a whole lot of attention to sometimes maybe, but so, what's a Sabbath day journey? Are they saying this is on the Sabbath day? No, not necessarily. But it was a term that was used in that time to let someone know. You know, if we tell somebody it's about three blocks away, we know what we're talking about. It's about three blocks away. But if you're in the Sahara Desert, <coughs> and you're talking to some nomad out there, and you tell them, hey, I just saw a water hole over here. It's about three blocks away. They got no clue what you're talking about. I wouldn't think. So we see things in the Bible, and we get to wondering, okay, they, they went back to Jerusalem. It was about a Sabbath day's journey. So I'm thinking, okay, well, how far can you walk in a day? But is there something specific about a Sabbath day, this or that? A Sabbath day journey was the distance when the Israelites were in the wilderness. It was the distance from the tabernacle to the furthest tent when they were camped out, when they all came in and camped and had their tents set up. A Sabbath day journey is the <coughs> furthest one. You know, because they, they weren't supposed to do any work. But you could walk to the temple. You, weren't, you don't need to do any more than that. It's about 3,000 feet. If you, different commentaries I read, some say it's about a half a mile, some say it's about three quarters of a mile, but it's between a half and three quarters of a mile. 3,000 feet is 
almost 60% of a mile. That's kind of interesting. just interesting, I thought. So they didn't have too far of a journey, but here they were on the Mount of Olivet. They watched Jesus ascend into heaven. They just, we didn't cover the verse, but Jesus had went into heaven, and that's when two guys were standing there beside him. You know how they, these angels would just show up? You know, you're sitting there watching, and all the next thing you know, oh, there's somebody right here beside me. I didn't see you walk up, because they probably didn't walk up. But he's telling them, you know, where are you watching? He'll come back, and he'll come back the same way he went up there. He'll come back in a cloud, which is kind of neat and reassuring as well. But they went to Jerusalem, just a short walk, about three-quarters of a mile. And they got there, and they went into an upper room. Might have been the upper room of the Last Supper. Might not have been. Might have been the upper room where they were all meeting when Jesus came and appeared to them, most of them for the first time. Might not have been. Not that important. Uh, but it was an upper room, which means that it was above the street level in an area that, was, that can be private. It wasn't in an area that's in the marketplace and a lot of people milling around and a lot of distractions. They met in an upper room. And it was a pretty big room, I would say, as well, because when they start talking about all the people that were there and the women that were there, I've read where there was probably 120 folks. <coughs> probably about 120 people. The beginnings of the church. And they all... They all went there. Why'd they go there? Because that's what the Lord instructed them to do. To go there and to wait. He told them the Holy Spirit was going to come upon them. And he's told them these things that they were going to do. You know, sometimes we, we understand God's will. And we know what he wants from us. And sometimes we get anxious about it. We're ready to go. We're ready to do it. Let's go. And we, sometimes we have problems with the patience because he told them to go and wait. Why would he tell them to go and wait? There's no time like the present. Let's get going. Let's get cracking. Let's get at it. But sometimes, sometimes we, we need to be prepared. Sometimes we need to prepare ourselves. Sometimes, we need to understand the gravity of the situation. We need to understand just how important it is. Sometimes we need to go and pray. Sometimes we need to, to go and pray for God's will. Sometimes we need to go and pray for each other. Sometimes we need to go and support each other and encourage each other. And go and study God's Word. And go and talk about exactly what lays before us. And discuss exactly what God's plans are. To make sure we're all of one accord. To make sure we're all in unison. Which is what they did. Which is what we do in worship services. They go and they met. And they prayed. And they all met in unison. They all were of one accord. They all studied God's word. And they prepared themselves. They prepared themselves for what God laid before them. In his time. It says here in the same context that Jesus told the apostles that he would send the Holy Spirit as comforter. He also told them, for without me, ye can do nothing. This is why the Jerusalem church had to wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit. Without him, they were powerless to do anything. With him, they were powerful witnesses for the Lord. And with the Spirit of God dwelling in us, we can say with the Apostle Paul, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God. We have the power, but are we witnesses? 
I would guess that if we were all honest, none of us witnessed for the Lord as we should. Maybe we are afraid, too busy, or just do not know how. But we really have no fear but God. And Paul said that we believers will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Then he said, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Whom do we fear, God or man? If we are too busy, it is likely in pursuit of our own entertainment. But if we do not know how, keep studying the book of Acts, and we will see over and over examples of witnesses for the Lord. So, why do we fail in witnessing to other people? I'm not saying fail continually. I'm just saying there's times that, that we do. Is it because <coughs> we're busy pursuing our own desires, or is it because we don't know? Or is it because we're afraid? But like he said here, who are you afraid of? You afraid to approach this person here on earth that can't do anything to you? He can't eat you. He can't hurt you. Or are you afraid to answer to God for not talking to this person? Sometimes we just worry about the here and now. Just get past this moment. Oh, I'll do that again. and I'll, I'll do it some other time. I'll have another opportunity. I'll have another chance. But we don't know that. And I sure don't want to have to answer to God as to why. What was your reason for putting that off? I don't have one. I was afraid of them, but that's silly. I was busy doing something I wanted to do, but that's even sillier. I, I, I didn't, I didn't think, I didn't think they deserved it. You didn't deserve it either. None of us deserve what Jesus Christ did for us. None of us deserve the price he paid. If God puts it before us, if you feel led to share with somebody, if you feel the Holy Spirit leading you to do something, to say something, to go somewhere, know that, like Jesus told them, he's given them all the power. Giving them all, he gives us all the power and all the ability because God knows for certain that we can't do it on our own. But he also knows for certain that we can do it through his power, with his help. So we need to follow this example they laid out. We don't have to wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon us though now, but we do need to, to pray about it to wait for God's timing and to act on it when God lays before us. So that instead of answering to God for why we didn't do something, we'll be able to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. Well done, my child. For taking care, for, for acting on that. With that, I'd like for us to go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning thankful, Lord, for your Son, Jesus Christ. Thankful for all that he did for each and every one of us, for his death on the cross to pay for our sins. Thankful, Lord, for all that he shared with, with the apostles, for all that he shared with the community around him. And thank you, Lord, for inspiring men to put this down in, on paper, to share with us today. Thank you for, for Luke and and what we're studying here today in the Acts of the, the history of the early church, thank you for sharing that with us so that we can apply these to our lives just as they applied it to theirs. I thank you, Lord, for Mount Zion and her ministries, and I just pray that we will seek your will in all that we do. I ask forgiveness where I fail you. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.